All right, we're going to go ahead and get started this evening. We might still have a few more folks joining us, but if so, they can sit in the front of the class, or we have a few seats left <laughs> in the back. Uh, welcome, everyone, to Atlanta History Center. I'm Claire Haley, Vice President of Special Projects here for the History Center. It's absolutely my pleasure to welcome you to this author talk featuring Scott Shane. He will be discussing his book, Flee North, The Forgotten Hero, and the Fight for Freedom in Slavery's Borderland. I have to make sure I get that subtitle right. It's an absolutely fascinating story uh, that I promise that many of you, or most of you, have never heard. So I'm really excited for you to get to hear more about it this evening. Just a couple of quick things before I introduce tonight author. We do have the book for sale. I see several of you already holding your copy. If you have not yet purchased your copy, they're available out in the lobby. They're 25% off tonight only as a thank you for being our guest at tonight's event. And Scott will be sticking around afterwards to sign those copies as well. Um, so please go ahead and grab your own. If you have someone that you need to get a gift for, sign books are <laughs> A-plus <laughs> gift giving, I promise. Yes, Christmas presents, never too early. Um, so we really encourage you to buy a book because it supports Atlanta and a history center being able to author these, offer these programs and of course supports uh, hardworking authors as they go on book tour. Um, one more thing, if you do have a cell phone in your pocket or your pocketbook or your purse or wherever it is, if you don't mind just making sure that it's on silent, we would really appreciate that just so that we have an uninterrupted program this evening along with making sure that these curtains are closed so that the camera picks up a better picture. All right, I'm going to introduce tonight's author and then turn it over to him because I know he has a lot of interesting things to tell you about tonight. Scott Shane was a reporter for 15 years at the New York Times. He was twice a member of teams that won Pulitzer Prizes. Before that, he was at the Baltimore Sun for 21 years. His two previous books, Dismantling Utopia, which was a firsthand account of the collapse of the Soviet Union, and his latest before this one was Objective Troy, which was a story of an American terrorist killed in a drone strike uh, on orders of President Obama. In 2019 and 2020, he was a fellow at the SNF Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins University, where he taught courses on media and the Russian attack on the 2016 presidential election. And tonight's book, of course, is about an abolitionist story prior to the Civil War. So he's covered a little bit of everything. I'm really excited uh, for, he, for him to be visiting us from Baltimore tonight. We're so appreciative of your trip to Atlanta. So please join me in welcoming Scott Shane. Hi, everybody. Uh, I guess this fancy microphone is working OK. Everybody hear me? OK, uh, so um, thank you, Claire. And thanks. She gave me, a, a, me and my wife, Francie, who's right over there, a terrific tour of the Atlanta History Center, which is pretty amazing. Um, I, I don't think I've ever been in a history museum this good. <laughs> so, uh, and I wish we had more time in Atlanta. I'm sort of squeezed between book events, but, um, but we'll be back. So, and, and one reason is this is my native state. I was actually born in Augusta. Um, unfortunately, I only hung around for about a year, so the, my memories are a little fuzzy at this point. But, um, but anyway, it's, it's great to be here, and I really appreciate your coming out. So, uh, and this is, let me see, did I turn this on? Let's see. No, I will, though. There we go. This is the clicker. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit before I start showing slides, and then I'll pause a few times during the slides. And you guys are really sort of aboard the shakedown cruise because this is only second, uh, it's my third book event and the second time I've shown slides. So, and I bulked them up a little bit today. Uh, um, it's it's uh, unfortunate that the, from the 1840s, it's a little tough to, to get uh, everything you need uh, in terms of visuals. I have three main characters and, and there's a, a pen and ink sketch of one of them. <laughs> and the others, I don't know what they look like. So. Uh, uh, in, in this talk, I'm going to introduce those three major characters, uh, two good guys and a bad guy. Every book has to have a bad guy. And, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry to say the bad guy was from Georgia. Um, and I'll talk about the two big themes of the book, which are, are basically the Underground Railroad and the domestic slave trade. And, uh, but to start with, before we kind of get into that, um, I want you to imagine for a moment a little girl five years old who's enslaved in Washington, D.C. She is the property of a physician. 
named William Gunnell. And she's been given a job, even though she's five years old, and the job is to stay awake in the bedroom of her enslavers all night every night and um, sit up beside the baby's cradle and if the baby makes a sound, start rocking the cradle. Uh, and which is really kind of a, a poignant story that stays with me. The next thing that happens is her parents uh, decide to, they're going to join basically a mass escape attempt. And one of the big problems they face is they have to get her out of that bedroom in the middle of the night when they're planning to take off without waking uh, the, uh, the couple who are in the bed, you know, a few feet away. Um, and they, the mother of the five-year-old manages to pull that off. And they walk across D.C. in the middle of the night. It's past the curfew for African Americans, which was 10 p.m. And they go to a kind of um, meeting point uh, uh, for 15 people who are going to try and escape. And they discover that the, the people who are organizing this, who are my, um, two of my characters, have not managed to get the wagon and team of horses that they need. So then they have to be kind of parceled out to sheds and barns and attics around the city for 24 hours while these guys get their act together and get the wagon and the horses. Uh, but that happens. But of course, by then, uh, these people come from several different households. Their disappearance has made a big impression. And so uh, the slaveholders are you know, comparing notes and beginning to send search parties to the north slave catchers, people looking for rewards. And uh, so they, they assume, understandably they assume, that uh, the wagon or the, 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 the people who are escaping have taken off the night that they disappeared. Um, they don't know that about this hiccup that, that delayed things for 24 hours. Anyway, the, the wagon takes off the next night and it's heading north and it's somewhere north of Baltimore when they, uh, the axle breaks and they pull off into a clump of trees and just at that moment they, they watch a big party of um, bounty hunting slave catchers headed south having not found any, any trace of them on the road north. So, uh, so the broken axle kind of saved the, the day and the next they're heard from, uh, they're sending a message from Troy, New York. So that is uh, just one of the poignant stories uh, f from my, uh, my research of slavery in the 1840s, basically in the mid-Atlantic, um, which I refer to as slavery's borderland because it's so close to the border of Pennsylvania. And we'll talk about that. And, and you know, the, the I, you know, this, sometimes people think of this, the history of slavery as unremittingly grim, and it, it often is. But there are these stories of bravery and daring and sometimes victory um, that are mixed up in there. And, uh, you know, this story is, is this book is actually full, full of such victories. So this book, I just want to tell you a little bit about the origin of the book. So it really began about 25 years ago. Uh, I was living in Baltimore. I, we still live in Baltimore. And I had lived in this, we had lived in the city for a number of years. And I thought I kind of knew the history as a reporter. Uh, and we spent a lot of time, as many people did and still do, hanging out at, around Baltimore's Inner Harbor. I don't know, raise your hand if you've been to Baltimore's Inner Harbor. There's a bunch of you. Okay, so it's a very pleasant place, uh, especially at that time. You know, we would push our little kids in strollers and we'd buy fudge and the baseball stadium was nearby. And, and uh, so it was a very pleasant place to spend a summer afternoon, a summer evening. And then I came across the fact that Baltimore's Harbor had been 
the Locus, uh, a, a major port in the domestic slave trade from about 1810 to the Civil War. And the slave dealers, the slave traders, had their so-called slave jails, their private jails, all around the harbor. And then I kind of learned about the dimensions of the domestic slave trade. We'll get into this later. And it just was shocking to me. And I, uh, I believe it was in 1998, towards the end of 1998, and we're having a meeting at the Baltimore Sun uh, about what we wanted to do in 99, the next year. And I said, I want to write something about slavery. And I think I got some eye rolls from the editors who were kind of like, you know, we actually tend to focus on current events. And, uh, but anyway, I, I persuaded them and wrote a long story about the slave trade at Baltimore's Inner Harbor at the time. And I always wanted to return to that subject because um, you know, I'll share some things with you about what really um, made me um, horrified and fascinated by it. And also because I felt then, and I feel today, that very few Americans really understand the scale and nature of the domestic slave trade. So anyway, um, I quit my day job at the New York Times at the end of 2019. No one told me there was going to be a pandemic. And, um, and so I started, I, I dug into, I started rooting around the history of slavery in our, in our region and um, looking for a story initially in the slave trade. But virtually all the people being sold south were illiterate. The slave traders were literate but not literary. They didn't, you know, write uh, books and journals and things about their um, trade. And so it was kind of hard going. I couldn't find characters. I couldn't find a story. So I sort of enlarged the, um, my, my circle of research and started looking at other people. I heard about a guy who'd been in prison, an abolitionist who'd been imprisoned in Maryland Penitentiary, and started looking at him. Anyway, um, I, so I was led to the good guys. And thank God, actually, because to spend three years just on the slave trade would have been kind of depressing. And on, on the bad guy who I will tell you about, uh, it would have been tough. So, um, you know, and, and gradually I realized how these two subjects, the domestic slave trade and the Underground Railroad, uh, come into kind of conversation with each other, which we'll talk about. Um, and so now I want to introduce you to these characters. The guy who became the um, most important character in the book is, uh, his name is Thomas Smallwood. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about him. He's, uh, let's see. So uh, I do not have an image of him. Uh, but he was, but his signature is very appropriate for a reason I'll explain. He was born in slavery in Bladensburg, Maryland, which is right outside DC in 1801. And he was taught to read and write basically by his enslaver who happened to be a, uh, a minister who uh, worked at a lumber yard, but who, who was pretty hostile to slavery. But he could not free Thomas and his sister because of a complicated inheritance thing, which was not uncommon. Thomas and his sister had been inherited by uh, this guy, John Ferguson's second wife. And ownership was shared with child her children from a previous marriage. So it was very complicated. But anyway, they made, a, they made a, an agreement. And this was the manumission paper uh, that I found in the Prince George's County court records outside DC. And essentially he said he would free Tom, he told Thomas when he was 15 he would free him at, age, at the age of 30, but that he would have to buy his freedom. That uh, apparently John Ferguson had to pay $500 to his wife and her children. And so the idea was Smallwood would have to earn that off. And one of the places he earned, he earned the money uh, 
is that it was uh, working in, as a household servant for a DC educator who had started a number of schools. And he was from Scotland originally, and he was apparently a fanatic about education. And he had a bunch of growing children who were around the home. And they all took a hand in, in kind of encouraging Thomas Smallwood to read and to learn. And so Smallwood, by the time he's free at the age of 30, is a, a completely self-educated man who has never gone to school for a day in his life, but is very well educated. He knows contemporary literature. He knows past literature. He knows philosophers. Um, and, and so he's kind of an astonishing guy. But he still has to earn a living. And he starts a business shoemaking. This is Washington, D.C. in, I think it's 1833, but it's basically Smallwoods, um, Washington. And the big white building, at, you know, center left there on the water is the Navy Yard. And the Navy Yard is still there in D.C. You can see the uh, U.S. Capitol up on the hill and the White House, then known as the President's House, way over in, on the left. And uh, so Smallwood's house was right just a couple blocks from the Navy Yard there. And uh, that's where he ran his shoemaking business. And he was sometimes referred to in, in contemporary um, newspapers as Smallwood of the Yard. So he was apparently, uh, you know, in other words, Smallwood of the Navy Yard, he, everyone knew his shoe business. And, and uh, so he was, you know, a, a solid citizen. He showed up in the city directories although just as colored, C-O-L apostrophe D. Um, he, so he's a, a free black man. He married a, a free woman from Virginia. They had four kids and another one on the way. And let's see, uh, here's a map of DC, which just gives you the kind of overhead view. Number one there is Tom, Thomas Smallwood's house. Uh, two is the Navy Yard. Three is where John Ferguson, his former enslaver, lived. And they remained on good terms. They were kind of neighbors. Uh, and that's the National Mall, or what became the National Mall up on the far left. And you can see the Capitol um, uh, top right. Uh, so, and uh, here's the Capitol. Before the, the, the dome we all know was only added in, during the Civil War in 1863. So this is what it looked like in Smallwood's time. Uh, and so he gets involved as, uh, as a free man in his 30s. Uh, he gets involved in the debate over colonization. I'm sure a lot of you guys are history buffs and you, you know what colonization is. But for those who don't know, it was um, a movement to encourage uh, black people to move, black Americans to move to some other country, um, in the Caribbean or in West Africa usually. And the, the sort of um, major country of destination was Liberia, which was actually founded by the American Con um, Colonization Society. And so the idea was to encourage people you know, more or less to give up on, a, uh, on the United States and, and make a new start somewhere else. And Smallwood got very entranced by this and was very involved in the debates over it. And he supported it for a number of years. He had some friends who were, um, a friend who trained as a pharmacist and opened a pharmacy in Liberia and would come back and go on the lecture circuit and try and encourage other African Americans to move to Liberia. But at some point, like a lot of people, um, he, felt like he had, um, the scales had fallen from his eyes, and he came to understand the colonization movement as basically a, um, an ethnic cleansing operation designed to remove black people from the United States, or at least free black people from the United States. And he realized that it had some slaveholders and uh, what they referred to in, in those days as the slave power behind it. And uh, that, so uh, he, he turned around 180 degrees and began agitating against it among his friends. Um, but I think he was very concerned with the problem of slavery, the crime of slavery, and what to do about it. And 
So he finds himself with a good business, with a, you know, his family's in good shape. Um, he's kind of come of age politically, and uh, he wants to figure out something he can do basically to battle slavery. And of course, he's D.C., Maryland, are, it's slave country. So he's, he's in, the, in the belly of the beast in that sense. Um, so uh, just about that time, uh, when Smallwood is actually about 40, this guy shows up in D.C. Charles Torrey was about a dozen years younger than Smallwood and had almost, you could say, the opposite education. He's from New England, and his grandfather was a member of Congress, and he goes to Exeter and Yale. So he's had sort of the most prestigious education you could get in those days whereas Smallwood has completely educated himself. But I think they were almost on equal terms. It's very, it's very interesting. Um, he had uh, graduated from Yale. He first tried his hand at um, school teaching. And I think it's fair to say it was a catastrophe. Um, and um, you know, we all probably know people who tried their hand at, at teaching and just found the kids ran over them. And apparently that was his experience. This is, he was a big journal keeper and his journals are preserved. So, um, you know, this, in this one he says, as far as my temporal matters are concerned, one of disappointment and almost pecuniary embarrassment for, for at this moment, I have not one cent on hand, the number of pupils small, some considerable debts. He apparently, he, he started with five pupils that went up to 20 and then it went back down to five. And then he seems to have been fired. Um, so he then tried his hand at preaching. And alas, it went no better. Um, but for a couple of years, he, he was uh, preaching in different churches. I found a record uh, of a parishioner who described him as a miserable preacher. Uh, <laughs> So things weren't going so well uh, for him, but at the time he, uh, at that, basically at that time, he got extremely interested and active in the anti-slavery movement. And this is really where he caught fire. So he's a guy who had sort of screwed up at two professions, and then uh, he finds himself really passionate about something. And I guess doing all right. He went on the lecture circuit, and he, um, had a big fight with William Lloyd Garrison over the direction of the abolition movement. And he and his buddies split off with Garrison, started their own newspaper, their own organization. Um, and at that point, uh, he, uh, he decides, he comes up with another scheme, and in a way, another profession. He uh, decides he's going to move to Washington and he talks to a bunch of small abolitionist papers around the North and says, I will be your Washington correspondent. And I will send dispatches about um, Congress and the debates over slavery. And he actually signs up a bunch of them. And so in, uh, in late 1841, he moves to Washington. And he instantly sort of stumbles upon his first big story. So he's trying his hand for the first time as a journalist. Uh, and he, he learns that a slaveholders convention is taking place in Annapolis, the Maryland capital. And so he decides he's going to go essentially confront the slaveholders or, you know, see what they're up to, write dispatches about the terrible um, slaveholders for his, his papers. And he shows up there, but very quickly <laughs> they, they spot him, they tell him he needs to leave, but instead he goes up in the gallery. And then they start shouting at him, and he's surrounded and kind of manhandled. And pretty soon, he's out on the streets of Annapolis being trailed by a mob uh, of, of angry people who are trying to argue whether they should lynch him or tar and feather him. And at that point, he's arrested more or less for his own um, preservation and locked in the Annapolis jail. And in the Annapolis jail, he he, he is incarcerated uh, just for a few days, but with two black families who are awaiting uh, a verdict, a court verdict basically, on whether they're going to be sold south from somebody's estate. And so he learns a whole lot from them. And he, uh, he 
about this whole experience for the Northern Papers. And of course, he's the star of his own show. So um, this is uh, the, a little patch from his, his article about the, what he refers to somewhat grandly as the pledge made in Annapolis jail. And you know, I will not cease to talk, write, preach, pray, and vote against slavery till there is no slaveholder in any church or any slave in our land. And uh, so, you know, he was a young guy, he was 28, um, but a little full of himself, but um, very passionate about the anti-slavery cause. So the next thing that happens is, this is Mrs. Paget's boarding house, her, an ad in one of the Washington papers. Uh, and there she's trying to attract the students um, arriving in the city. But Charles Torrey boarded with Mrs. Paget, So he's hanging out in her boarding house. And Thomas Smallwood's wife did the laundry for Mrs. Paget's boarding house. And Smallwood has been reading about Torrey's adventures and is sort of intrigued by this crazy white man um, who would go to this slaveholders convention and get locked up and everything. So, he asks his wife to introduce them. And uh, so they're introduced right at the beginning of 1842. And you know, when you think about this meeting, these guys are opposites in many ways. They kind of meet across the chasm of race, of course, but they're also of different generations. They're 12 or 13 years apart. And one, again, is a Yale graduate. The other is self-educated. Um, one was born in slavery, one was born into a somewhat prominent family. Uh, but they have reached a stage kind of in their own thinking where I think they really connect. Um, and I think it has to do with the difference between talk and action. So Thomas Smallwood has been in a lot of overheated Washington, D.C. meeting rooms, you know, um, arguing about colonization. Uh, with his fellow African Americans. Uh, and Charles Torrey has been in a lot of probably less overheated meeting rooms in, in New England talking about abolition and arguing about the abolition movement. And you get the feeling that both of them are a little bit sick of talking about this and they want to do something about it. So uh, they come up with a scheme and the scheme is to assist escapes, to encourage escapes and assist escapes. And I'd say three things set them apart from uh, some of the, uh, you know, of course, people have escaped from slavery in every, you know, every country where slavery has, <laughs> has existed. Um, there's nothing new about that. But, but some things set them apart. One is, especially at the, especially at the beginning, they're not content to just let people decide they want to take off and assist them. They're actually, Smallwood is going out and, and essentially going to people. It's a, DC is a small town at this point, 23,000 people. He knows everybody. He's, so he's going and talking to his enslaved friends and saying, ha, ha, you know, you ever think about moving north? And uh, so he's, uh, the law at the time uh, pre prescribed six years in prison for enticing so, uh, an enslaved person to, to flee. And so it was highly illegal, highly risky, but he was encouraging people, recruiting people essentially. Uh, the other thing that set them apart was they didn't want to do it in ones and twos if they possibly could. They wanted to do it by the wagon load. So they were trying to get 10, 15, even 20 people, men, women, and children, pack them into a wagon, cover the wagon, disguise it some way, and wait till the middle of the night and just take off. And that was basically their, their, um, their operation. They, they would try to make it to, if they were leaving from DC, they started late, later, there were escapes from Baltimore as well and, and the surrounding counties. But um, if they were leaving DC, they'd try to make it to a safe house around Baltimore the first night. The second night, they'd try to make it across the uh, Susquehanna. Uh, and the third night, they'd make it into Pennsylvania and, as Smallwood puts it, into the hands of the Quakers. The Quakers would help the people get to Philadelphia, and after that, it was usually on, on trains and steamboats. So part of their effort was to raise the money to buy the tickets uh, to send people farther north. And uh, 
I should say that there was a big debate in the abolition community at the time as to whether to encourage people who had fled slavery, uh, encourage them to stop on American soil, often in, in New York, or to keep going and cross the border into Canada, which of course was the British Empire. The British Empire had abolished slavery in 1833 and was much, much safer. You know, even in New York, you were not necessarily safe from the slave catchers. So um, some people said that they should be encouraged to stay on U.S. soil and uh, you know, support the abolitionist cause. Uh, a lot of formerly enslaved people went on the lecture circuit and talked about what it, what it had been like in, uh, uh, you know, under slavery. Um, but Smallwood was of the opposite camp. He just never trusted that it would be safe for anybody who had fled sla slavery to stay on U.S. soil. So he was always telling people, you know, cross the border into Canada, cross Lake Ontario. And um, so some of, the, um, some of the signs of what they were up to, this, this is not from my book, but I couldn't, uh, I couldn't keep myself fr from uh, putting this in there. Um, this is actually from, uh, from 1809. And it's a poster, a reward poster. But one of the paradox of runaway ads, uh, which I've read a whole lot of for this book, is that they are often describing the, their enslaved uh, workers in very complimentary terms, and terms that suggest they might do very well out in the world at large, but saying, please drag them back into um, slavery. And this one just has always struck me. You know, Peter speaks German as well as English, can do a little at blacksmith. There's more to this. He says, I raised him for plantation work, and he does very well at all the plantation skills. But he's also a blacksmith, shoemaking, carpenter, and has some knowledge of making gun barrels, and also plays on the fiddle and fife tolerably well. So, so you just think this, this bilingual, you know, jack of all trades who also happens to play two musical instruments, and this guy wants him to come back. Well, I don't blame him for wanting him to come back, but I don't think Peter came back. Um, now, the runaway ads in, in D.C. and Baltimore um, begin to show Smallwood and Tory's hand handiwork. Um, and uh, you know, here are some with some huge rewards. You can basically use a factor of 30 or 35 uh, for these numbers. So these are uh, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars being offered for these, the return of these folks. But one reason they are, here's a, here's a bigger, one, uh, an enlargement of one of them. One reason they are uh, offering so much money is that they're for multiple people. So here are two people running away, $150. This one's $400, but you realize that it's uh, George, John, and then uh, lower down, I believe it says, um, there are two others. Uh, maybe I cut it off. But, uh, but there, are, there are at least four or five people um, who, who that reward is being offered for. And, and so when people are leaving um, you know, by the wagon load, that's, that's what happens. Um, and so Small was seeing these ads, and uh, you know, there's sort of like each one is a, is a compliment to him. Um, now here's a guy, if you think about the circumstances of Thomas Smallwood in 1842, um, he's running, presumably very busy running his shoemaking business by day. He has a big family to support. Um, at night he's organizing these incredibly complicated escapes. You know, if you're, if you're trying to round up a dozen people, 15 people, um, they come from multiple households. You're trying to communicate with them, you know, in, a, in an unobtrusive, clandestine sort of way. And you have to get them all to sneak out of basically their enslaver's home uh, in the middle of the night without being noticed, sometimes with kids. And uh, that's a lot to do all night long. Yet somehow he found time to begin to write all these dispatches and send them to an abolitionist newspaper in Albany. Albany was on the route that most of their people took north, and there was a very active community there supporting them. 
protecting them from the slave catchers who, who would show up there. And, um, and so this newspaper, which, which is called Toxin of Liberty, uh, there it is, um, Toxin being an old word for bell, so it was basically Liberty Bell. Um, this newspaper started to run these dispatches that Smallwood sent, and he sent them, of course, um, under a pseudonym. They, pu they were published under a pseudonym because everything he was doing was completely illegal, um, and he was in grave danger. But these were accounts of escapes and the accounts used the real names of the slaveholders and the real names of the people running away. And they were basically, um, you know, he was a big Charles Dickens fan. And he took his pseudonym from Charles Dickens. He called himself Samavel Weather Weller Jr. Sam Weller is a character, black, I think, in, in uh, Dickens' Pickwick Papers, which was a global bestseller at the time. So he steals a name from uh, Pickwick Papers, but he makes him this character's son, Sam Weller Jr., and that's, that's the signature he puts on it. And I think his style is very influenced by Dickens. And so he ha these are kind of these rollicking, often funny, um, satirical pieces, mocking the slaveholders, celebrating these people making their, their escapes. And, you know, to all, <laughs> to the readers, uh, to all appearances, just, he's just having a grand time with this. Um, and I just, I'll give you a couple of little examples. This one, he's talking about Tory. So Tory takes off after a few months and becomes the editor of Toxin of Liberty. So he's on the receiving end of these, um, these satirical pieces. And, you know, just to, th in, in this case, I, Samuel Weller Jr., will continue to uh, scoff at, annoy, and expose the slaveholders in their crooked ways to their perfect mystification and great pain during weeks and months to come, the poor ignoramuses to think to catch such a weasel as I asleep. So he, he's, they're wonderful letters. And uh, I put seven of them um, in the back of, as, as an appendix in the back of this book. But I quote them, I quote them a good bit. And I think they may be the only real-time account of escapes that exists or that, that ever existed. And that's because, um, you know, it was rare and not necessarily that wise <laughs> to be writing about your escapes. And uh, I, I don't want to give away... Uh, this story, I'm trying to avoid spoilers here because reviews have been very kind to this book and the word thrilling has been used very often. So I don't want to spoil it for you. But, um, but anyway, uh, he's having a great time. And I realize I have to speed things up a little bit here. But then, uh, so the, the next thing I want to talk about is just a fun little um, research discovery. Uh, so I'm reading along through these papers. The papers were stored, the biggest run of this paper that existed, I found, was in a warehouse of the Boston Public Library. It's COVID, the Boston Public Library is completely shut down, and, uh, but finally I got somebody on my side on the library staff, and he started agitating to try and get somebody to dig these things up, and, and eventually he, after months of back and forth, he tells me they microfilmed them all. <laughs> So microfilm seems kind of 1950s, but whatever. Uh, so I went, I went down to the, to the Boston Library and spent a long day downloading them from microfilm onto a thumb drive and, uh, and then months reading them. And so I'm, I'm reading one day and I come across uh, Smallwood saying, uh, as usual, addressing a slaveholder by name and saying, you know, you're, you're puzzled by the disappearance of, of your, you know, your servants. Um, maybe they left by that underground railroad or steam balloon that one of your um, constables, police constables, was swearing about the other day. And then later he, he reveals a little more. So there was a notorious constable in Baltimore, based in Baltimore, works at, worked in Washington a lot too, named John Zell. And like all the early police officers, he made, in that region at least, he made a lot of his money 
from the rewards paid by slaveholders to, for you know, the return of runaway people. And so, um, so he, was very, he was keenly aware that a lot of people were escaping from Washington and Baltimore. And he was very frustrated by it, and he couldn't figure it out. So him saying they must be getting away by Underground Railroad is essentially like me saying they must have been abducted by aliens. There were railroads, but there were no underground railroads. And so he was, he was just saying, I don't get it. It's impossible. How are they doing it? So after Smallwood mentions that, he then starts riffing on it in, in a lot of these letters, in most of the letters. And he advises, um, he's often offering comfort to the slaveholders who are uh, grieving over the loss of their beloved servants. And so he uh, suggests that they go to the office of the Underground Railroad in Washington to inquire uh, what, what's going on. And uh, he appoints himself here, right? Uh, the, uh, here I am back to my post as general agent of all the branches of the National Underground Railroad Steam Packet Canal and Foot It Company. So, um, so he, he's riffing on this. Uh, from you know month after month, but I'm thinking like, is this have I made a discovery here? Is this you know is this really where the Underground Railroad gets its name? And so I look around and and there are a couple of theories from the 1830s about uh, where the Underground Railroad came from, but they don't really hold up to scrutiny. One of them is uh, a guy in the 1860s remembering what he read in a Washington newspaper in 1839. So, um, so no, scholars had generally not credited any of those stories, and the, the official position was we didn't know where it came from. And when you then, you know, the sort of proof was to go into the big 19th century newspaper databases that exist now. I'm sure some of you have used them. Newspapers.com, another one that was very useful was genealogybank.com and put in the Underground rail Railroad, or sometimes four words, Underground Railroad, which is the way they often wrote it then. And, uh, and sure enough, all the first, all the early uses of Underground Railroad comes from Thomas Smallwood. So he was the guy who, who named the Underground Railroad. Um, and that has never, you know, he's been basically lost to history. And so no one has ever noted that before. So um, let me, let me uh, let's see, how are we doing here? How are we doing? OK. OK, I'm going to speed through uh, the next little bit. Um, so, but I have to take you to uh, the bad guy. Hope Slatter, uh, originally from Jones County, no, Warren County, Georgia. Um, later, the sheriff, as a young man, the sheriff of Jones County. Um, he gets into the, uh, he gets introduced to slave trading because as sheriff, of course, you oversee estate sales and disputes and things. So he found himself auctioning off human property in many cases. And he, he got into the slave trade and eventually in 1835, he begins visiting Baltimore hotels. And then he sets up shop early in 1837. And for about a decade, he's the dominant player of about half a dozen in the Baltimore slave trade. He's shipping people to New Orleans, um, accumulating them at his slave jail, uh, which is very near that inner harbor of Baltimore. Um, so I will just run through these rather quickly. Almost every day in the Baltimore Sun, he ran these cash for Negroes ads. Uh, here's a 1840s map of Baltimore. His slave jail is number one. The, uh, the basin, as, it, as the Inner Harbor was known then, is number two. Um, so here is a picture. Amazingly, there was a photographer whose work survived. That's what the harbor looked like in the 1840s. That's a Baltimore street scene from the same year, 1845. And this was his slave jail. Uh, in 1910, obviously long um, out of use and you know, clearly being used to store a bunch of junk, but that was where he would accumulate people behind bars until he had a shipload to, to take to New Orleans. Um, as, as you probably know, the, um, the tragedy of the domestic slave trade, which moved 
somewhere a, around probably three quarters of a million people through the slave traders and a million total, because some people were moved with their uh, slaveholders. Um, but a million people over about 60 years uh, before the Civil War. And it, the, the most tragic part of it was is it often separates uh, families. So this is from an anti-slavery book. The gentleman with his hand in, in the air is being sold. He's saying goodbye to his family. The enslaver is presumably the woman uh, at right. And the slave trader is the guy with the striped pants and the top hat. Um, this is uh, a notable anti-slavery poster, mainly because it's focused on the US Capitol. That's the Capitol up there. There's a ship. Uh, and it's basically an anti-slavery propaganda poster uh, focusing on the trade, which was very active in Washington as well as Baltimore. Um, this one I will, I can get to in questions if we want to. But the last point I want to make is how these two phenomena interrelate. My char the three characters, their paths do cross. Um, I won't tell you how exactly. Um, but the, it, it makes sense to combine these stories. Um, these are two quotations from a guy who went around, wrote, wrote a book of, uh, after interviewing people in Canada who had escaped slavery. And um, they, <coughs> so they, in many, many, many cases, they say the reason they fled was they were afraid they were about to be sold south. And Thomas Smallwood himself notes that people often approached him because uh, they, they, he says they, they got wind that their masters were about to sell them to the slave traders. So the last slide here is actually a map from the front of the book. And it's, uh, it's essentially you know, what really struck me after being immersed in this world for a couple of years is the existential predicament, you could say, I guess, of somebody who was enslaved in that region or in the upper south. One is they had to live every day, every hour, with the threat that they could be sold south. Somebody, one of Hope Slatter's boys, could show up. Um, you know, some money could change hands. Shackles would be put on somebody, and they'd be off with it, without even an opportunity to say goodbye. And, and people were aware of this because it was happening to their neighbors. It was happening all the time. It was a mass, uh, mass operation. And so they had to live with that. But if they were in that part of the country, they also knew, probably knew, that Pennsylvania, a free state, was not that far. So if you were enslaved in Georgia or let alone you know, Alabama, Louisiana, um, you could try to flee north, but you had a long ways to go. And uh, so um, that's what brings together these two movements, one to the north to freedom, often in Canada, and the other uh, to the south, to the cotton plantations and sugar plantations of the deep south. So I will, I will stop it right there, and uh, I welcome any questions. Yes, sir. I was wondering if uh, the Victoria Mr. Smallwood came into contact with Frederick Douglass at all, being from Baltimore. That's a great question. Um, now, Douglass took off in 1838, um, and so it is unlikely that um, Smallwood knew Douglas before, although it's possible they'd cross paths um, because they, you know, they're living in different towns. But uh, Tory probably did encounter Douglas on the kind of New England anti-slavery uh, lecture circuit before coming down to Washington. But he doesn't say anything about it, so uh, we don't know for sure. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Well, yeah, the low life kind of characters. Yeah, well, um, it's a very, very interesting question because Hope Slatter, uh, in addition to making a ton of money, um, his other preoccupation was respectability, to earn acceptance among the kind of elite in Baltimore. And 
um, most of the elite or many of the elite in Baltimore were slaveholders. So it wasn't like they were you know, anti-slavery. But uh, they needed somebody to look down on. And the slave traders were the ones they looked down on. And the slave catchers probably too. But you know, of course, the irony is the slave, the enslavers, the basic slaveholders, were reliant on the slave traders. Often, if they needed cash, literally the, the phrase used was the threat that an enslaver would use to, to somebody would be, I'll put you in my pocket. If you don't work harder, if you do this, if you do that, I'll put you in my pocket. That meant just send a note down to the harbor to Hope Slatter and have the person carted away and shipped down away from family to New Orleans. So they relied on the services of the slave traders. And when people ran away, they relied very much on the services of the slave catchers. But they, they looked down on them. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, you know, I guess that's just human nature. Yes, sir. Well, that would be a spoiler. I could not, uh, <laughs> I could not reveal that. Yeah. I could not reveal that. I will say that, um, that one of them lived to see the Civil War. <laughs> uh, yes? The, the abolition movement, you know, we, we heard I, you know, pre, you know, post-war. Absolutely. I think, you know, I mean, I think the answer is really that in the 1830s is when it really took off in the North. And every town you'll find, um, you know, has its own abolition society uh, or kind of abolition club and, and uh, the kind of lecture circuit heats up. And um, Garrison is, uh, William Lloyd Garrison is a big leader at the time. And they do, they have all kinds of other schemes they try. In 1835, they try a mass mailing of anti-slavery literature to the South. And um, this results mainly in the arrest of uh, a number of mostly African-American uh, folks for handing out this uh, literature, which was literally illegal even in Maryland. Uh, so, um, you know, so, but they, they got very active in the 1830s. And, uh, and I think it kind of continued from, from there on out. One of the things that's very interesting is you go back in time to like the 1810s. I think in 1810, there's a grand jury report. And as you may know, you know, grand juries used to not only indict people, but also used to kind of look at civic situations, civic problems, and issue reports on them. So there's a report on the terrible conditions in the slave jails that were beginning to pop up in Baltimore. And there's a bunch of citizens saying, we can't put up with this, and you know, men and women thrown in together, and we can't have this in our city. But you know what? Uh, they got used to it. And by the 1840s, it was just part of the commercial sector. You know, the ads ran every day, cash for Negroes, and um, you know, they just got used to it. And uh, so I, I, think, uh, you know, I think the anti-slavery movement kept on going. One other thing I'll say is that it was this region, maybe, maybe a little bit in Ohio as well or um, around the Ohio River, but especially, I think, in, um, in the Chesapeake region. Uh, I describe it as a, call, a kind of boiling cauldron, basically because uh, everybody was there. So if you go to Boston in those days, you're never going to meet a slave trader. If you go to New Orleans, you're never going to meet an abolitionist. But there were abolitionists and slave traders and slave catchers uh, and uh, you know, slave holders uh, and free African Americans and enslaved African Americans. And they're all bumping up against each other in this region. So that's one of the things that makes it very, very interesting um, to write about. Yes? Yeah, I guess, I mean, that is a great question and one that I don't really have the best answer, but I think it has probably to do with the demand for labor uh, 
in, in the cotton, uh, you know, cotton plantations in the Mississippi Valley and, uh, and also the sugar plantations in Louisiana. And so that's where probably New Orleans was closer to the core of the demand for labor. Um, Hope Slatter had a, what was literally called a showroom in New Orleans uh, where he would put his um, property on display. Uh, dressed, very well dressed. The men wore top hats. Uh, and then they'd be, you know, sent off into these sort of factory farms. Uh, <clears throat> other questions? Yes? What happens to the people who have to make an action? <laughs> Well, so the, the, uh, the slave catchers gave up, you know, said they might, I didn't know how, you know, they didn't go this way, basically. So they pass by, they, uh, they repair the wagon, and they take off, and, and they make it. <laughs> they make it, they get away. Uh, and in fact, Tory writes to Smallwood, because Tory's driving that wagon, and he writes to Smallwood from Troy, New York, I have arrived here with the chattels, I believe, because... Uh, they kind of would use the uh, slaveholders' language in an ironic way at times. Um, so uh, anyway, so that was a that was a. There's some there's some uh, there's some escapes that end badly, <laughs> very badly, and there are some escapes, uh, you know, a lot of escapes during oh, during the two or three years that they were active. Um, you know, I, I say that they. Uh, their flame didn't burn for long, but it burned pretty bright for a while. So, <clears throat> other folks. Yes. We're exploiting people. Um, you know, it's interesting that you ask that. Smallwood um, always protests that he made no money off of any of these trips. And I, you know, I'm sort of immersed enough in his life that I think that was true. Um, but he was sometimes accused by his detractors and enemies uh, of, you know, profiteering or whatever. And he sometimes did encourage the people he was helping uh, to raise as much money as they could for the cause of buying, you know, tickets. Uh, uh, because, you know, you, you picture, when you think about the Underground Railroad, you picture people running through the woods, you know. Or uh, on the cover of my book, there's a famous painting of, you know, a family escaping on horseback. But uh, once you get into the free states, a lot of it was just riding the train, riding the steamship. So most of the folks they were helping would make their way to Philadelphia, then usually go to New York by train, and then usually take a steamship up the Hudson to Albany. And then there were various ways, places to go from there, um, often by canals. Uh, and eventually, most of them probably made it to Canada. Yes. Um, there were some. I don't know a lot about it, but there, there were some attempts to escape to Mexico. There were also, um, you know, significant numbers of people who fled into the woods and swamps in the Carolinas, probably in Georgia, and who, in some cases, you know, lived for years in wild country where, you know, beyond the reach of the law, basically. Um, but that's a great question. I don't know exactly the, uh, the circumstances in Mexico. But, that, but a lot of these folks, I mean, the great bulk of the enslaved population, which was about 3 million when these guys were operating, um, was, of course, a long ways from Mexico. A long ways from Canada, too, but closer, closer to Canada. Yes? Black Seminoles from Florida. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yep. Yes? Um, do you happen to know if at all, Troy, mm -hmm. 
I do not know. I mean, his roots are all in Massachusetts. Um, but if, you know, it could have been some Tory relatives, um, uh, you know, later on uh, who, who were r related. I, I, one crazy thing, uh, uh, I, I ended up um, with my wife in Mobile, Alabama, doing some research for reasons that the book will make clear. And uh, the guy who runs the History Museum in Mobile is Chuck Torrey. <laughs> And he's actually related to Charles Dory. So there are definitely some southern branches of the family. You bet. Yes. No, no, I don't mind getting political. I mean, um, I, I, well, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I, was, I was thinking about asking you guys a question, and, and I know time's running out, but he, the question I was going to ask you was, um, why do you think we know so much about the Underground Railroad and so little about the domestic slave trade? My I used to like to ask my colleagues at the New York Times, who um, are quite well educated and pride themselves on knowing what's going on, Anyway, uh, what was the domestic slave trade? I have yet to find one who actually knows. And you know, anything about its scale, its nature, family separation, and so on, um, I think there's a reason. Anyone want to take a, a guess at the reason we know so much about the Underground Railroad and don't know my, much about the domestic slave trade? Sir? The positive. The what? The positive. We all, we all want to hear a story that ends well. Right. Well, that's exactly right. But also. The Underground Railroad has a place for good-hearted white people, and the domestic slave trade sadly does not. So I think that's I think that's it. And I so I, I think the uh, in terms of these movements in in various legislatures and among various governors to police the teaching of slavery and other subjects, um, I think is um, personally I think it's just ridiculous. <laughs> I think we're, you know, over the last 20, 30 years, we've made a lot of progress in trying to understand that part of our history. And to put the brakes on now or to, you know, to turn around and go back is kind of nuts. And I must say, it does remind me of, this is very much personal history, but um, my wife and kids and I lived in Moscow for three years, um, and I was a reporter in Moscow. And it happened to be at the time under Mikhail Gorbachev where uh, the press was opening up, and Russians were learning their own history, the history of Stalinism, and um, and the you know the, the history of of the Soviet Union under under the Communist Party for the first time, and uh, it was an amazing time, it was just an amazing time, and I and then Putin has over twenty years put that genie back in the bottle. And I think there's a close relationship to what Putin did in Ukraine and what he's done you know, to his own people. So I, th I, you know, and I so admire the Germans for how they've dealt with the Holocaust. And it's true that they were the loser in World War II and therefore it you know, might, have, might, have been, might not have been that way if, if uh, they were the victors. But, um, but I think we need to face our history, including its darkest moments and and as I said, this history is very dark, but it's spotted with people. You know, it's, it's like replete with stories of human courage. And a guy like Thomas Smallwood ought to be as well known as Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass, in my opinion. Um, he's an amazing guy. And uh, I hope, I hope you, if you get a chance to read the book that you agree. Yes. Yes. Shh. <laughs> yes. No, he had to make his own escape, and it was a hell of an escape. Um, you know, it's, uh, they did not take kindly, let's put it this way, they did not take kindly to him um, helping all these people away from their uh, owners. I didn't mention this before, but the, uh, the wagon load with the five-year-old in it, the five-year-old who had been rocking the baby's cradle,
I did a rough calculation that the 15 people who were in that wagon would have been worth, in today's dollars, about $200,000. So um, every wagon load you can think of as like a bank robbery. And for many of these enslavers, this was a huge portion of their wealth. And part of the whole goal of what Smallwood and Tory was doing was to demoralize the, the slaveholders, to convince them that this was not working for them. And Smallwood describes overhearing a couple of them say, after he had helped uh, their workers uh, disappear, say, I'll never buy another slave. I'm going to hire people from now on. So he's like, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so anyway, that's, uh, and one more, that's it. And, and again, I think it's, um, I know that Tory died very young from tuberculosis. Yes. And um, Smallwood lived to a very ripe old age. Amazingly. And um, when Smallwood lost the connection with um, Tory, <laughs> did that affect his um, ability to do things and his life course? I'm going to have to refer you to the book. <laughs> it's sort of a complicated answer, but, um, but, it, but it's all in there. <laughs> anyway, I've gone way over, so. Uh, Please join me in thanking Scott Shane for his time tonight. Uh, thank you all. <clears throat> if your interest was piqued by this conversation, there is far, far more in the book than was able to fit into a lecture. It's for sale outside 25% off. Scott will meet you out at the table to get it signed. Thank you to everyone tonight for braving the traffic and making the time. We really yes. appreciate it. I guess you, some of you guys were stuck out there in the, in the traffic jam. Yeah. <coughs> Thanks again, everyone. I'll be out here if anyone has any more questions. <coughs>